So welcome back from your weekend. Uh, ho hopefully it was a good one. Um, we're, we're pushing towards the end. Uh, it's, it's not too far. That's left. Uh, until Monday the 23rd of May. So um, we s today we're going to switch from the world of AutoCAD into the world of SketchUp. Um, we, we decided to include SketchUp um, a long time ago as part of this class because it's kind of your, your basic level 3D modeling program. And uh, the way it folds into 121, you know, obviously you guys have already been using it, um, it kind of naturally works well uh, for the basic level stuff that you need to do. Certainly if you're designing things like the Mondrian Museum, SketchUp works great because it's very um, orthogonally based, for, for lack of a better term. Um, it, it does not work particularly well when we get into any kind of curving fancy surface objects, but it works great for the basics. And, and certainly for massing, um, there, there's, there's really it's a, it's a very fast way of working through things uh, and being able to model a lot of great things. The other great thing about SketchUp is that it's free. Um, the version that we have on the school computers is SketchUp Pro. Uh, we pay for the Pro license, which is great. It gives us a few more options in terms of exporting uh, to AutoCAD and, and vice versa, which is, which is nice. You can, I believe, get the Pro version for yourself as a student license for 50 bucks, I think. Uh, but again, you have the pro version here. The other nice thing is you can work in the free version at home, and then you can bring the file in here and use all the pro features without any weird watermarks or anything happening. So um, you're, by all means, download the, the free version so that you can work at home, work on your laptop, etc. So the other thing that I will add to the discussion about SketchUp is that SketchUp has a very SketchUp-y look to it. And there are many in practice who don't particularly like the way SketchUp looks, or if you're in a review and you show a basic SketchUp drawing, they may discount you or say, oh, that, well, that's just SketchUp and it doesn't look very good, or thinks, you might think it's less professional. So I will focus a lot of my energy on how do you take something from SketchUp and make it look good, um, which you kind of learned in AutoCAD. A lot of it was about how do you, how do you learn the basics of AutoCAD and then make it look good. Uh, same thing here, we're gonna take SketchUp and we're going to spend a lot of time bringing it into to, to Photoshop uh, and or Illustrator to make some corrections, make it look really good, uh, et cetera. So my guess is, if I were to ask you, and I'll, I'll go ahead and do this, how many of you have already opened SketchUp and already feel very comfortable in SketchUp? Kind of. OK. I would, I would, have, I would have projected more of you would, would agree to How many people have used SketchUp before? OK, that's better, right? So maybe, maybe. In my discussions, I'll make you feel a little bit more comfortable in SketchUp. I certainly have confidence that I will make your SketchUp stuff look better uh, in the end, which is, which is certainly my goal. But the other thing that's important to, to, to note in the very beginning of talking about SketchUp is that I'm not going to spend an inordinate amount of time going through commands or how do you do certain things. Obviously, when you come across something that you don't know how to do, you ask me and we'll, we'll go through it. I will talk through a lot of the basic features that I think are important. Uh, and I will also talk at length about taking AutoCAD and bringing it into SketchUp, working with it, and vice versa, because I think that's an important skill to have. Um, but at the same time, there is so much content out there to teach you how to do things on SketchUp that it's rather redundant for me to sit here and go through it. Um, so follow the online tutorials if you're struggling with something. Uh, but the bulk of what you're, that you need to do is available rather easily with a few simple commands in the push-pull tool, uh, which is what we'll concentrate on. So I just like to point out that this is not going to be an exhaustive how do you model in SketchUp. It's going to be much more about how do you make things look good in SketchUp. So today we're actually going to have a two-part lecture. The first part, I'm going to talk about some of the basics of SketchUp, how do you work in SketchUp, what the interface does, etc. cetera. Uh, we'll, we'll let you model for an hour or an hour and a half or so, and then we'll come back and I'll show you some post-processing techniques. So we actually do a little bit of post-processing on the first day um, to talk about shadows and, and that sort of thing. And then we'll continue concentrating our, our efforts forward as, as we move forward. So I've gone ahead and I've opened up the, uh, the SketchUp program. And when I do that, I get this little welcome to SketchUp splash screen. And uh, frequently, people don't actually spend time and look at this. They just click on the Start Using SketchUp icon, which is fine. Um, but we do have some options here. We have a simple template in feet and inches, which will work fine for architectural purposes. But we also have an architectural design feet and inches template. It changes the background colors. It changes the overall look 
um, and makes it a little bit easier for what we're trying to do. So I'm going to use the architectural design feet and inches uh, template. If you chose something else, not a big deal. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and click on start using SketchUp. All right. Um, we're not going to download the new, the new version of SketchUp. We're going to stick with this version uh, for right now. And when I open up SketchUp, it looks a little bit different than any of the programs that we've, that we've used so far in this class. Uh, and so it's important to kind of note that. The other thing is it's entirely possible that my view doesn't match up with your view. What else is new? We've seen this uh, over and over again. Uh, the big difference uh, is that I have the large tool set showing here by default, which is on the side. If you don't have the large tool set showing and you only have a toolbar that goes across the page, uh, you can go to um, view and then toolbars and you can check the box for the large tool set, uh, which will give you the tools on the left hand side. For what we're doing today, you won't need any of the tools that are on the left hand side, but ultimately we're going to get to cutting sections and that sort of thing and you will need the tools uh, that are part of the large tool set. So if you go ahead and check the box for large tool set, um, that, that can certainly help out a little bit. So uh, I also can get rid of the little construction worker person because um, she shows up by default and they change it every version of SketchUp as to who that person is. It, it used to be Susan. I don't know who it is now. But we can go ahead and get rid of that person uh, because we're not going to need her uh, for right now. So what you're going to be working on in exercise 124 is a model of Francis Ching's cube house, which is shown in isometric view on the bottom of your handout today. It's also available online. You may have worked with this um, building in your 130 class. I don't know. It may have gotten cut out of the 130 curriculum. I, I don't know uh, what the current state of it is. But it's a really good example of kind of getting things working in, in SketchUp and figuring out how to build and move and, and work with objects uh, and groups, which is what we're going to work with today. So like I said, I'm going to cover some of the basics for what we're going to do. Uh, and I'm going to start with just the basic rectangle tool. And when I click on the rectangle tool and I move over into space, um, notice that there's an instructor panel that pops up here by default when you open it. If you're struggling with what to do, you can pay attention to the instruction panel. The self-help is, is reasonably good. So what I'll do is I'll click and I'll drag out a, a rectangle. Now, when I get that little diagonal line that appears in the center of my rectangle, that means that my rectangle is square. The other thing is in the lower right corner, if you, if you see down there, it says dimensions and it tells me a value. Okay, so right now my square is 4 foot 1 and 5 eighths by 4 foot 1 and 5 eighths. Well, that's not quite the 4 foot by 4 foot square that I ultimately want to draw. I can, however, while I'm still holding down the mouse, I can press the tab key and type 4 feet, comma, 4 feet, much like we did in AutoCAD, and hit Enter, and it will draw my square. The difference between SketchUp and AutoCAD is that I have to actually be holding, oh, no, they changed it, sorry. Uh, I don't, I can click and then I can press tab and get down into that, that space, four feet, comma, four feet, and then it'll finish the size of my object. Now notice that I'm working in perspective, so both of these are in fact four feet by four feet. They just don't look the same, but it's because of the perspective view that I'm looking in, okay? So now that I've drawn a single face here, I, I can select the face and therefore select the surface. And when I select the surface, I can come over and use a tool called the push-pull tool. And this is a really great, quick way of modeling uh, in the world of SketchUp. Essentially, I can click and hold and drag up to create this box uh, for myself. And once I'm do doing that, again, I want it to be four feet. And instead of trying to really get in and, and precisely get to four feet, I'm just going to go ahead and press the tab key and type in four with the apostrophe and hit enter. And that will create the four foot by four foot cube. If you want to orbit, um, you're going to need to pick the orbit tool, which is right here, to move around. And I will, I will warn you ahead of time that in the world of Rhino, we right click to orbit. And there's going to be a bunch of times when I'm lecturing when I'll try to right click to orbit <laughs> because my brain's programmed that way. So um, just, just be aware <laughs> that I may make that mistake. Um, so I now have this four foot by four foot um, cube that I can work with. So I could select this cube, and I could copy this cube. I'll go to Edit, Copy, and then I'll go to Edit, and then Paste, and it will give me another cube. 
Now, one of the things that happens in the world of SketchUp is when I move two objects close together, they kind of snap together, and I get a little green dot, and it says endpoint. That means that these two objects are going to be connected together, okay? like they are right now, which is what I want. Ultimately, I'm going to create four of these going across. Now, the world of SketchUp works a little bit different than some of the other 3D modeling tools, is that once you touch two objects together, they become kind of semi-joined. And so if I were to start to modify, let's say I took this piece, and I went to the Move tool, and I started to move it, it kind of stretches and is, is glued to it. I can't just move it away anymore. right? Likewise, if I took all of these faces, and I tried to move them away, Right? They're stretching that first object. So that's one of the inherent difficulties with SketchUp, is that we have to kind of think about how we control the object and keep it a separate object as we build. And so in this context, rather than just copying and pasting this set, before I do that, I'm going to make it a group. And groups will keep the object separate in the world of SketchUp. And so I'll right click once I've selected the object. And I'll say, make group. We'll talk about components a little bit later. But for right now, we're just going to stick with groups. So I'll make this a group. Now, when I select this object, it will select the whole object rather than the individual faces of the object, which is what I want. So I'll go ahead and click on the object. I'll go to Edit, and then Copy, and then Edit, and Paste. And you see that now I can drop these two together. But I could select one, go to the Move tool, and I could move this one object, and they're not t attached anymore, which is what I want. So I want to be working with these where they're detachable. And so we'll go ahead and connect those together. And now I'm going to go ahead and keep copying these. And one of the things that we can do in the world of SketchUp is we can hold down the Control key, or we can click the Control key, press the Control key. Uh, and you see that my Move tool adds a little plus icon next to it. That's essentially copying and moving at the same time. So I can continue, and again, I'll do Control, just copying these in a row. And I need eight of them, one, two, three, four, five. Oops. Six, seven, and eight. Okay. Now I need a few more, so I'll select all of them. That. And I'll go back to the Move tool, and I'll press the Control key. I should, I should tell you, there are hotkeys that switch between the tools. I'm not going to use them, because I want to, to have you see me click the tools, et cetera, on the video. But if you want to use the hotkeys, by all means, use the hotkeys. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these, and I'm going to copy them back, going this direction. Like that. And let me orbit a little bit here. And let's continue. And I'll go back 8 as well. OK, so I have 8 by 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Perfect. And so if I were counting the squares here, uh, My front, right? I have a little kind of triangular piece that, that, that juts out. And I don't have any pieces here, 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 or there. So I've built up this grid right, with my little cubes. And now I want to modify these two front pieces so that they're, they're in that shape that is at the front. Okay? So what I'll do is I'll select the object, or both objects. I can hold down Shift and select both. I'll right click on them and select Explode, which is essentially ungroup in the world of SketchUp. And so once I've exploded them, I now have the ability to start to edit these independently uh, of the rest of the object. So I'll come over to the little pencil tool, or the line tool here. And I'm going to draw a line that goes across the top diagonally from endpoint to endpoint like that. When I'm done, one of the things that you'll notice that happens in the world of SketchUp is whenever you divide a surface with a line, you create two surfaces from the single surface. So I can actually come in here, and I can delete this half of the surface there and there. And you can see that I now 
kind of look down inside of my shape. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line again using the line tool from the bottom here to here. Like that. And when I do that, I've now created a rectangle and SketchUp's going to fill it in with a surface. So I can look down there and see that it now has a surface. So now that I have that, we can go ahead and delete some of these other pieces like that. And I can also delete these lines like that. And you can see that I now have the pointed front. So I can do the same thing here with the line tool. I can go from right there to right there. I gain the surface in the front. And I can also delete all of the content that's here that I don't need. Okay, So I've now divided that. The next piece is these last three need to become a ramp. So I'm going to essentially do the same process here with these last three to make them a, a, a ramp. So I'll select all three, one, two, and three. I'll right click and I'll explode. And then I'll use my line tool to draw a line that goes diagonally across all three of those points, like that. And once again, it divides the surface so that I have this half and this half. I can go ahead and I can delete these pieces like that. Now, I don't have the diagonal line along the back side just yet. So let me go ahead and, and uh, use my line tool and draw down the back side. It fills in there. And I can go ahead and delete these upper squares there, there, and there. Now, I have a problem. And that is that this surface here isn't divided by this surface yet. And so I have to add one extra line. And let me orbit a little bit so I can see this better. You know, I have to add one extra line that goes from here to there, and a line that goes from here to there to divide these vertical surfaces. And so now I can take this, and I can delete it. I can take this, and I can delete it, and this last one, and delete it. Now I still have a few extra lines, so I'll go through and I'll clean up those extra lines by just selecting and then pressing the Delete key. Oops. There. And they can go away. Now, I don't know on the screen whether you can see this, but you see how I've got a little bit of weird kind of grayish shading that's happening? Basically, that means that there's two surfaces that are coplanar. They're on top of each other. And so to get rid of that gray shading, I can actually just delete these little surfaces that are leftovers like that. And I'll get rid of those because these are um, grouped objects. The other option would be to right click and explode these three objects. And that would then connect those two surfaces together. And that would go as, away as well. <coughs> okay. So what I want you to concentrate on today is building up these these blocks, so to speak. And so we'll start with these 4x4 four four cubes. If you create a 2x2 two two cube for the 2x2 two two sections, um, you can start to, to glue those pieces together. Uh, again, there's a 1x4. There's a few various types. Uh, I'd like you to spend the next, we'll say, hour and a half, so until 10, um, modeling this up as far as you can go. If you don't make it the whole way, it's fine. We're going to stop modeling at 10. Uh, and then I'll show you the post-processing techniques and the basics of bringing it into Photoshop. Uh, so we'll do just a little bit of post-processing, and then you'll post your work uh, for today. Like I said, I'm going to split my lecture into two parts. So I'll talk finishing now, and then I'll come back at 10 and talk a little bit more. Okay? Are there any questions about SketchUp that I can answer just yet? No? All right. I'll see you at 10. OK, so it's a little after 10. And as I promised, we were going to split the lecture. And the second half, I'm going to talk about post-processing. Um, so what I'm concerned with is not that you have the complete cube house. If you didn't quite make the, the complete cube house and it's under construction, we can still do this post-processing. And you can still post it um, as part of today's exercise. But I want to walk through this post-processing because it's something I want you to start getting used to. And of course, we'll be evolving this um, over time as we go forward. So um, essentially, what I'm doing is I'm going to part three Photoshop under uh, exercise 1.2 or uh, 124. And so I have the, uh, the Francis Ching cube house here established. And 
I'm going to pick a view that looks attractive to me. And it's really, it's up to you as to what your, your particular view is. Obviously, I probably wouldn't pick the back side because I chose not to put anything on the back side. Uh, so I'll pick something in the front. If you want to be looking down on the house, that's fine. If you want to be looking from eye level at the house, that's also okay. It's really, it's a matter of your own preference. I'm not going to be specific about, oh, you have to do it in this particular view um, for you to be able to, uh, to show it for today. Today's very, very flexible. Uh, so once you have a view, though, it's important to save it as a scene so that we can return to it, we can make multiple exports from it, etc. So under the default tray that's available here on the right side, this is something that's new in SketchUp 2016. In SketchUp 2015, you used to have to go to Window and actually open the various windows. Uh, but now it's in this default tray, which I think is nice given the size of the monitors. You just have it kind of over on the side. We're going to go to something called Scenes. I already have several scenes, scene one, perspective render, and scene three. We're going to add another one that will be this view. Essentially what a scene does is it preserves your view and your specific angle and whatever so that you can go back and, and re-render or, or re-export from that same view. So I'm going to just click on the plus icon. And when I do that, it'll say scene four. And I can double click on scene four, or excuse me, I can right click on scene four and I can go to rename. And we could call this, uh, I don't know, uh, scene four, <laughs> for lack of something better. Uh, but we'll leave it as that. Uh, and so the advantage here is that, see, I have some other scenes that have been saved before. If I double click on any one of these uh, particular scenes, I'll jump from one view to the other view, et cetera. So today I'm going to export scene four. So I'll go to scene four. All right, there it is. And now I'm going to start working through several options. And this is something that I've, I've, I've written up as a tutorial so you can follow it. And of course, I logged myself out. But it's under Tutorials. If we go to SketchUp Styles for Photoshop, it's SketchUp 4.4. It will help you uh, kind of walk through what these styles are. And I'll refer back to it as we go forward. So what I'm going to do to start is I'm going to go to the Styles little drawer here. And I'm going to go into the default styles. And I'm going to pick something called hidden line, which is right there on the end of my, my row. And when I do that, I'll get a basically a line drawing, a very simple line drawing of my, of my view. Um, the axes, the blue, the red, and the green axes are still showing. And I don't want those to show in my ultimate um, you know, rendering. So I'm going to go up to view, and I'm going to uncheck axes so that that goes away. I'll also go and uncheck guides, and I'll uncheck section cuts for right now, so that I have essentially just a nice, white, clean line drawing, which is what I want. From here, I'll go to File, and then I'll go to Export. And I'm going to export a 2D graphic, not the 3D model, a 2D graphic. And when I export the 2D graphic, I'm going to change my Save As type to be a uh, JPEG. There it is. And I'm going to make sure it goes on my flash drive here. We'll put it into today's folder. And I'm going to create a folder for uh, scene four. All right, so this is the cube house. And I'm going to add underscore lines to my export so that I know that this is a line drawing export. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my options tab here, or my options button. And this is something that, that won't matter for what we're doing today, but long term it's really going to matter. And that is that I, I can choose to specify a width and height in pixels of my export. And so if I want to specify something other than the view size, other than what I see, I can uncheck this box and I could specify a value. So maybe 3,000 pixels wide by 1,700 tall, something like that. This value is going to vary based on the size of your final output. So if we're going to print it on a 36-inch plot, right, the plotters print at roughly 300 dots per inch. So I would need 300 times the width. Um, so we'll say uh, 300 times whatever uh, 36 inches. You multiply that out and get a ridiculously large number of pixels. Uh, and you'd have to make sure that that pixel count matches. Okay. I believe that SketchUp is limited to 10,000 pixels. Yeah. So 9,999 is the maximum that SketchUp will allow you to export. Okay. We don't need that many. Um, 
So let's do maybe 2,000 for today. Okay. I'm going to make sure that my image is set to best quality, which is fine. I'll go ahead and say OK. And I'll save this in that folder. So that export's now done. So now I'm going to go through and I'm going to change some options and I'm going to look at some different things. So I did this, this step two for hidden lines and I turned off what I said I was going to turn off. I exported at least 2,000 pixels. Right? Now I'm going to move to the middle of the styles panel, which of course things always change. And I'm going to choose edit. Right? And I'm, again, I'm referencing here. And I'm going to click um, the x-ray button. Right? So let me come over here. It's under faces, I believe. Yeah. So we move to the, so I'm at hidden line. I go to the edit tab. Then I go to, from the, the, the wireframe view into the faces settings, and I'm going to click on x-ray. All right? I'm going to go back and make sure that my guides and my axes and my section cuts are all off. And now I have a view where I can see into my cubes a little bit. Okay, so from this view, I'll once again go to File, Export, 2D Graphic. Um, and we're going to save this one as underscore x-ray. And I'm going to go to my options. The settings that I saved last time should be identical. So we, we're at 2,000. Uh, all the settings are fine. And I'll go ahead and click on Export. So I now have my x-ray view. Okay. Then we'll come back here. Um, and I already appended x-ray. Right. This next one will show just the guides. I don't have any guides. I didn't use any when I drew. So this one's I'm going to skip. But you can do it if you wanted to. Okay. Next one is going to be shadows. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn off x-ray so that we're back in this plane mode. I'm going to go over to my first option here, which is the edge settings. And I'm going to turn off edges, which on the surface makes everything go away. Okay, don't panic. We're going to click on this little shadows icon down here. Uh, and we're going to go to view and then turn on our shadows. Okay, so now that I have the shadows available here, I can adjust the time of day and the month of the year. So if I wanted it to be closer to today, we'd get into April. Right, what's today? The 25th? So there's today. And I'd adjust my time of day depending on what felt right. So maybe I like that time of day, uh, about 2 in the afternoon. Okay, so that's my, that's my time of day. And notice what I'm getting is just the shadows, not the lines, just the shadows. This is important. So I, don't, I could have the edges on, but I don't want this. I want just the gray values for the shadows. That's it. Okay? So now I'll go to File, Export, 2D Graphic, and we'll call this Shadows. Uh, yeah. So then, then I'll go uh, make sure that my settings are exactly the same, which they are. And then I'll go ahead and click on Export. And now I have a view with just the shadows showing. Okay. So then we'll move on. I did shadows. And the last one is going to be for a little bit of style. Right? And sometimes this looks good, sometimes it doesn't. But I'll show you how to kind of influence this in the world of Photoshop. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my styles. And I'm going to go back to the Select menu. And I'm going to go into Sketchy Edges. And I'm going to pick one that's called Pen Gray, if I can find it. Sorry, things moved around here. Pen gray. There we go. And I'm going to go to view. I'll turn off my shadows. And I have, this is just a little bit sketchier of a view. Okay? So I'll go ahead and I'll go to File, Save for Web. Or, geez, I'm still in the world of, I, how many times have I said File, Save for Web? It's just like comes out automatically. Export 2D graphic. And we're going to save this one as pen gray. And I'll go ahead and export. Again, all my options are set the same. Notice also that I haven't moved my view. I haven't rotated. I haven't done anything. I'm doing all the exports in a row together. Um, that's so that they ultimately will line up. Now, you may play around with some of the other options in Sketchy Edges. Uh, I found the, 
the airbrush with endpoints sometimes looks kind of not so good in this view, but when you do the export, it looks out, it looks okay. So sometimes I'll do this one as well. I'll go to File, Export, 2D Graphic. We'll call this one Airbrush. And, and essentially, any of the other views that look good to you, you're more than welcome to do as well. And I'll go ahead and click on Export. So once I have all of these views set up right, and saved, I'm going to go and I'm going to open up Photoshop. So we'll drop into Photoshop. And I know it's been a long time since you guys worked in Photoshop, but believe me, you'll remember. You just got to give it a little time. OK. So once Photoshop's open, I'm going to open the first file that I created. So I'll go to File and Open. I'll go to my flash drive. And we'll open up, where's Dropbox? There we go, 135 into today's folder. There it is. First one I created was the lines. So I'll go ahead and click on Open. And there it is. Okay, So it looks exactly like the screen. Everything looks the same. Now what I'm going to do is I, from here on out is I'll go to the File and then Place menu. And I'm going to drop each of these other views on top of this first view. So we'll take the next one here, which was the x-ray view, and we'll place that on top. And because these are all exactly the same, they'll lay up next to each other. And what I can do is I can take, well, it'll be more dramatic with the shadows. Let me go to File Place, and I'll drop the shadows in as well so you can start to see this. We'll go ahead and say OK. There it is. So I have my first building here. I have my shadows here, but obviously I'm not seeing through them. Remember way back to Photoshop when we worked on blending modes? Right? We had a blending mode that would take the uh, white area and make it go away. Right? That blending mode was right here under the first set. It was multiply. So I'm going to take this layer, and I'm going to turn the blending mode to multiply, and suddenly we can see through our object. Okay? I can take the x-ray mode, and I can turn the blending mode to multiply there. Like that. I'll keep doing a few more. I'll go to File, and then Place. Uh, and what was I? I had the pen gray. There it is. I want that to be up on top. Well, let me com commit to it. Make sure it's on top. We'll change the blending mode again to multiply. And we'll do this one more time. File place. And it'll be the airbrush. And we'll change the blending mode again to multiply. And so this has become a lot darker over time because I've layered it up, okay? which may or may not be advantageous. But let's take a moment. And let's work with just the shadows and our original right there. Okay? So you guys on the surface should be saying, why did I go through all this trouble? Because I could have just turned the shadows on and had the one export, okay? which you could have. That what you can't do, however, is you can't start to adjust the shadows. So what SketchUp does by default is it makes all the shadows the same value of gray. Okay? But shadows don't really work that way. Okay, in real life, shadows that are deeper in the, like say in this little crease in here, are going to be darker than shadows that are further out to the edges. So we can, on top of this shadow layer, we can use a dodging and burning layer to customize the shadows a little bit. So I'm going to create a new layer. I'll go to Layer, New Layer. And this is, by the way, Photoshop 1.5, I believe. And we'll call this Dodge and Burn. And this is going to be an overlay. And it's going to be filled with a neutral 50% gray. And I'll say OK. Now remember, if, this, if you got lost with what I just did, it is right here under 1.5. I was right on the number. And this will walk you through everything that I'm doing right now. So this is really the point in the semester where I'm going to layer on everything that we've been doing. So you did this in Photoshop. Now we're bringing it back and doing it again. It also shows you that there is method to why I teach you certain things, because it'll fold back on itself. OK, so I have a dodge and burn layer. We can actually turn off the background for just a second and look at just the shadows. And now I can come in with my dodge and burn tools. So let's go to my burn tool first. Let me zoom in a little bit. Again, I want to make sure I'm on my dodge and burn layer. And I'm going to go ahead and darken up a little bit of this section. like that. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Did you get the color, dark color? 
the dodge and the burn does the darkening for me. It's showing up right here on this layer. Okay, I can turn on my lines here just so you can see a little bit. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm darkening this area just a bit. I need to do this area over here as well. So let me add a little bit in there. Right. I could get a little bit more creative in that I could use a little selection so that I didn't accidentally come down here a little bit more. do dodging and burning to the area outside of this. So we'll go back to the burn tool, and now I can work at my edges there a little bit more. Let's make this bracket, make that a little bit bigger. Something like that. Press Control-0, and now you can start to see how I've darkened up that particular shadow. I could do the same thing over here. Uh, essentially what I'm doing is just selecting a little region to work with so that I don't darken the shadows that I don't want darkened. So let me come over here like that and I can come back to the dodge and burn and I can work on this a little bit more in this section like that and I can darken up this shadow a bit as well. So when I zoom out a little bit you can see that that has really darkened up the shadow and made it a little bit more realistic. Now I can do the opposite where I could go to say the dodge tool and lighten this time and I'll lighten out here at the edges, right, to soften up that edge. That was probably, let me back up a few steps. Let me make this brush a little bit bigger. Like that. And let's just take off the edge. Why did I? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Had the selection active. All right, so I can, I can lighten up this shadow so it's not quite as, as sharp at the edge. Maybe something like that-ish. Okay? And again, it's up to you what feels right for you. But you see how I'm already starting to customize this a little bit. Okay? So let me turn back on the x-ray view. Okay? This x-ray view seems kind of strong. I'm getting a little bit too much. I just want a touch of what that x-ray view would look like. So let me take the x-ray view here. And it's still on multiply, but I'm going to change the opacity down so that's just a hint of it. And you can see a little bit of it in there, but not too much, just, just a little bit. Okay? So that helps a little bit. And then I can turn on this view, which is the pen gray, which, which roughens up my edges a little bit. And if we look in here, right, we get these little ticks that go over. It's a little bit more casual. I think it looks pretty good. In this context, the airbrush might be a little too strong, so I'll leave that one off for right now. So one of the key things is that you always have to, to look at your work and edit your work and say, is it too much? Is it too little? You know, maybe this airbrush is still a little strong. I could adjust the opacity down so it's not quite as strong. It's just there. Right? The other thing is the dodge and burn is currently applying to more than just the shadows. Um, there we can see the dodge and burn, just so you can see what's going on. Um, it's darkening up my lines in here as well, but I only want it to do the shadows. So I'll select the dodge and burn layer and I'll press Control Alt G, which will tie the dodge and burn layer only to the layer directly below it, right? Which is good because now it's not going to affect the darkness of the lines the way that it was affecting it. Okay, so it's a subtle difference. So what I'm looking for today is a little bit of post post-processing, a little bit of Photoshop work, a little bit of dodge and burn. We'll get into doing a lot more with Photoshop and collaging and really customizing what the output looks look like. But this is essentially what we're looking for uh, as an output today. When I'm done, I'll go to File, Save for Web. I can finally say that, right? And when I say File, Save for Web, it's going to be a JPEG. And this is ultimately what I'm going to be posting on the uh, course website. So we'll call this the Francis Chinghouse.jpg. I'll click Save, and that's what you're going to post uh, as your end result for today. Okay, So just make sure you can get it in Photoshop. Make sure you can get these kind of combined together using the, uh, the layer blending modes. And then get your export out, and you're good uh, until next class. All right?